Warning: Diethyl ether is extremely volatile and flammable. Diethyl ether vapors are both narcotizing and toxic. Never do this experiment inside. Hi guys, this is MIH. This is our first video of the organic synthesis unit, which is going to be very long. Today we are extracting diethyl ether from Karstadter fluids, which typically contains a mixture of diethyl ether and heptane. Diethyl ether is a famous organic solvent known for its very low boiling point and very strong dissolution power. Like many other ethers, it is also infamous for producing explosive peroxides. I want diethyl ether for Grignard reactions that I will do in the future. The only chemicals we are going to need today is a bottle of car starter fluid and some calcium chloride solution. Any brands of the fluid are fine, since almost all car starter fluids contain diethyl ether. The calcium chloride solution acts as a coolant, and you'll see how it works in a minute. We also need a distillation apparatus, and I used the all glass setup I just bought recently. I moved outside and constructed my apparatus piece by piece. Here is a shot of everything we will need. I first put the hot plate on a few stacked boxes and put the magnetic stirrer under it. Then the distillation apparatus is installed above the hot plate. The temperature is monitored by a thermometer through a rubber stopper covered in aluminum foil. Covering with aluminum is not strictly necessary, but the ether will likely dissolve the rubber stopper. A small vial is put under the condenser. Notice that I used a dark colored storage bottle here, since ether tends to oxidize and form peroxides in air, and light can accelerate that process. To test if the heating and stirring components work well, I decided to do a mini test by boiling some water. I poured some water in the flask and turned on the heating and stirring. The cooling water pump is also turned on. I left this setup running for an hour, and when I came back, I realized that the plastic on my magnetic stirrer has melted due to the heat of the hot plate. Therefore, a test is absolutely necessary. I swapped the stirrer for some ceramic pieces, which will act as boiling stones and help control the boiling of the solution. Now I'm ready to do the actual experiment. I grabbed my bottle of car starter fluid and shook it around a bit. This is necessary to equalize the pressure inside the container. I then attached the plastic tube to it and started pumping out the fluid into the flask. Note that I did the step with the tube in the middle part of the flask. I also didn't fill the flask in one go. Both actions decrease the amount of ether lost in the process as vapors. Additionally, cooling the flask and the can beforehand may be helpful as well. I filled the flask about half full, or about 120 milliliters. I didn't measure the exact volume. I attached my thermometer on the stopper and placed the flask into position. Now I'm ready to start the cooling water flow. Since ether has a super low boiling point of 34 degrees Celsius, room temperature water cannot be used to condense it. This is when the calcium chloride solution comes in handy. The bottle of solution was put in the fridge last night, and to my surprise, it has partially solidified. My intention of using calcium chloride solution instead of pure water is to keep the melting point lower than the temperature of the fridge, so it will not solidify in the bottom. However, it seems like the calcium chloride was not concentrated enough to lower the melting point to negative 18 degrees Celsius. I then tried to dump all the ice out of the bottle, but failed miserably. In the end, only about half of the solution ice mixture came out. Anyways, I attach the tubing and start the flow of cooling water. Notice that there were some textures in the water. This is because the density of calcium chloride solution is higher than the density of water, and when the two liquids mix, those patterns form. Now I turn on the hot plate and start the distillation. Just 30 seconds after the heating is on, some bubbles formed on the boiling stones. These are mainly dissolved propellant gas, in my case, carbon dioxide. The bubbling became more vigorous over time, and not long after that, the solution is boiling. The temperature ranged at 35 degrees Celsius, and a little bit of liquid is starting to distill over. The solution boiled vigorously, and I decided to add aluminum foil under and around the flask to increase the heating efficiency. The temperature increased to 40 degrees Celsius, and a lot of liquid distills over to the vial. 
There are also some water condensed on the outside of the condenser. Here you can see the drip rate is about 2 drops per second. I decided to do a demonstration on how volatile ether is. I let the icy distillate drop on the cold ground, and about 30 seconds after, all the ether already disappeared. I then did another demo of spraying a small amount of the car starter fluid on the ground and lighting it up. The ether produced a bright yellow flame and left no residue behind. As the temperature of the cooling water starts ramping up, I placed the entire bottle of calcium chloride inside the large beaker to help cool the condensing solution. Over time, the distillation temperature slowly rose from 40 degrees Celsius to 48. It is very important to watch the temperature carefully at this point, because a sudden rise of the temperature indicates that the diethyl ether finished distilling, and the receiving flask needs to be changed. However, I didn't observe the sudden temperature spike. Probably my car starter fluid has other low boiling point ingredients. When the temperature reaches 52 degrees Celsius, I decided to swap out the receiving flask. I wrapped the mouth of the flask in aluminum foil to reduce evaporative losses. The temperature increased to 60 degrees Celsius, and a large amount of distillate came over. This is probably not diethyl ether, since the temperature is just too high for it to boil over. However, it didn't reach the boiling point of the other typical ingredient, heptane. My best guess for this is that my car starter fluid contained hexanes instead of heptanes, and since hexane has a boiling point of around 60 to 69 degrees Celsius, it easily boils over. The temperature continues to increase to 63 degrees Celsius, and the drip rate lowered to about 1 drop per 2 second. Not long after, nearly all the liquid in the flask boiled off. I didn't want to continue the distillation, since the ether peroxides, which are not volatile, tends to stay in the residue and possibly explode. Therefore, I turned off the heat and took everything apart. I realized that I still have some experiment time left. I came up with the clever idea to do the distillation again, so I proceeded to add roughly 120 milliliters more brake fluid in the same flask. I then did the distillation just as before, but this time I didn't bother to watch the thing all the time. Instead, I remembered that I swapped out the receiving flask 30 minutes into the distillation, and the whole process lasted 50 minutes. I then set up some alarm clocks, and came check the distillation only when it is necessary. However, I might have predicted the 50 minutes a bit too long, since when I came back, the temperature already peaked at 82 degrees Celsius. I stopped the distillation immediately and took everything apart. A slightly yellow, thick, oily liquid remained in the flask. After the process, I was able to obtain about 130 milliliters of relatively pure diethyl ether and about 60 milliliters of the 60 degrees Celsius distillate, whatever that is. The yield wasn't super amazing, since there were a ton of evaporative losses, but considering that one can of car starter fluid, which is, by the way, 450 grams, not 450 milliliters, costed me a bit less than $2, and I only distilled about one third of the contents of the can. I think this process is definitely a bargain for me, and obviously it is a much cheaper and much more efficient way to get diethyl ether and possibly some hexanes. By the way, the ether peroxides in diethyl ether might get very annoying. The standard way to test it is some starch potassium iodide papers, which turns blue when peroxides are present. The peroxide can be removed by shaking the ether vigorously with some sulfuric acid and ferrous sulfate solution. See you next time!